All right, guys. Well, today we are doing something a little bit different. We're going to share with you five clips of some homestead hacks that over the years we have learned really, really can be helpful in the kitchen. So let's get started. One of the worst things about making applesauce is peeling and coring the apples. Uh, that's probably one of the main reasons I never make applesauce. But I have since discovered this new method, that's not new, but new to me, of pre-cooking my apples ahead and then running them through a food mill, um, which saves so much time and so much hassle and makes great applesauce. Now, the only... It's not a downfall because most people who do canning have a food mill, but you do need a mill or something like that that you can process this through to get out the seeds and skin and cores after. So you want to take whatever size pot you're going to need for the number of apples you're processing and you want to make sure you've got about an inch of water in the bottom. Basically this kind of is going to create a steamed effect. Uh, if you had a steamer and we're only doing a small batch, again that's a great way to do it because you're not adding any excess water. Um, this Adding the excess water you're going to either want to cook that off or have a little bit runnier apples, applesauce. It depends on your preferences. If you've got something sort of palm of your hand size, I would quarter that. I'm not too worried about the uh, real bruised parts. It's more if they're kind of going bad that I would get rid of it. But when I open that up, decent inside, you're checking for wormies. And then you just bung them in. I'm actually going to, I think that's a bruise, but we're gonna take it off anyways, just to be on the safe side, because I got lots of apples. Smaller ones, I would just half. They can go through my food processor like that. Again, you're watching for things. These are, after all, wild apples, so you never know. But we're just gonna get them all cut up and in the bowl, in the pot, and then we're going to kind of simmer that until they start to break down, and then we'll bring you back. So you can see here, we are pretty much to that stage of being able to run this through our food mill. So at this stage, here comes uh, the main part of this homestead hack. Uh, you're going to take your apples, which are now all soft and mushy and delightful, and you're going to run them through a food mill. Now, I do have a Victoria food mill. It's a nice old one that uh, I would say just about every canner needs to have one of these. They are great for ketchups, sauces, and now we're doing applesauce. But if you don't have this particular tool, the handheld food mill will work just fine. Um, depending on how thick you want that, you can use the bigger, um, they come with different inserts. Uh, the only thing I will say is when you go to the bigger one, you get a chunkier applesauce, but the seeds can go through that. Uh, they don't always, but some of the little ones do. So I would probably stick with the middle size one, like what I would use for tomato uh, sauce as well. But I'm going to run it through the food mill. So we're going to get a few scoops in here. You still want this to be relatively hot. You don't want it to cool off too much, otherwise you're going to have a long time to reheat this again to can. But we just put some in and kind of give it the turn. You can see it's already coming out. Like I said, this is going to potentially need to cook off a little bit in order to get rid of some of that excess moisture. Just depends how um, thick you prefer your applesauce. But pop it in there. Take our little handy dandy pusher downer and that's going to come. This does make it a very fine applesauce. It's looking a little runnier now, but once you get going with all the apples, there you go, you can see it's coming through there. It thickens up woo, quite nicely and no seeds, no peels, no stems. It all just went a lot quicker. And the other thing that I really love about this is my applesauce stays nice and light colored. No browning. And I didn't have to soak it in lemon juice or anything like that ahead of time. As you can see on this scoop here, the apples didn't really discolor at all, which is quite nice when you're making applesauce. So we're going to get this all done, get it back in the pot, and we've got to bring it back to a boil and add all of our goodies and jar it up. But that is the end of our homestead hack section about making applesauce. I am going to show you a little tip or trick that we use here at Hickory Croft to uh, sometimes just get a few of those tomatoes gone a little bit quicker. What I do is I freeze them. Tomato ketchup, for example, I need 24 pounds of tomatoes. Now, with something like that that I want to have a thicker product at the end, 
Uh, I freeze. I freeze them. Uh, it helps with getting the skins off quicker and easier. Also drains out extra moisture as they defrost, basically. As you can see here, we've got our little Roma tomato. We just V to take out the core. You see? And then we just a nice little whoops, X in the bottom and into the bag she goes. It's that easy. I've got my scale close by so I do weigh each uh, bag just to make sure and I write them on there so I know I'm taking out the right amount. As you can see you just make a little X in the bottom. Basically what that does, the X in the bottom and cutting up, well you're, you're taking out the core basically with the top and the X in the bottom just helps for those tomatoes to drain a bit of extra water and also makes the skins come off so much easier. Uh, what I do for my tomato uh, ketchup is I'll take the bag, when I get it out of the freezer, it'll defrost, it'll be quite a bit of extra liquid, and I just kind of open a corner and drain sort of some of it out. Uh, it speeds up the process as well when you're making the ketchup because you don't have to cook it off for so long. I need uh, 24 pounds of tomatoes uh, in order to make my ketchup recipe, and I find each kind of Ziploc bag usually holds around 6 pounds. And again, just the same thing, take the top off for the core, and I just make an X in the bottom, and it gets bunged in whole, super quick and easy when you have them coming really fast out of the garden and just need to do something with them. And it also, like I say, speeds up the process so much when it comes time to make the ketchup. So for today's homestead hack, uh, we're going to show you a little trick on um, measuring um, your product when you're boiling it down for canning or any other type of recipe. In this particular video I'm making ketchup and you need to uh, boil it down by half. So this is a great little trick to show you uh, when you're at the halfway point. So what I did was I took my handy dandy chopstick and dipped it in and then I put the elastic band at the top so I knew the depth in my pot. Um, and what I'm going to do is in probably an hour or so I'm going to come back and um, dip that in again and see where we're at. There's my little pot. As you can see, we're about halfway boiled down. We used our handy dandy chopstick to mark whether we were halfway. And there you can see we're actually, I bubbled it down a little bit more than the two thirds that I would normally do. I did go closer to the half. This is a great simple trick. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about cutting up fresh herbs. There are numerous machines and things that you can get for it. The little slap chop thing, uh, which, uh, you know, it's kind of fun. It would work as well, but I don't have that. Uh, I have the options of either a knife or my handy dandy pizza cutter. Now this works great for any leafy greens like parsley, basil, mint. So right now we're in the process of making some fermented salsa which calls for two cups of cilantro to be chopped. Now this is the easiest way for me to do this. I basically just go back and forth over top with my pizza cutter, trying not to lose any because this is, I probably should have split it into two piles, but this is my method. I, you know, go big or go home. So you just kind of do that and you just keep piling it up. I turn my cutting board every now and then and just keep back and forth. And as you can see, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. You want it to be quite piled up because it does cut it better if it's piled. And of course, always watch your fingers because that's important as well. We need those to keep uh, doing all this wonderful canning that we're doing. But that's the basic process. You can take it as small as you'd like and uh, yeah, just a simple little hack that we thought we'd share with you. Winter squash, because they're such good fruit for storing, they have a really thick shell or outer uh, rind, um, which can be a little challenging and be a little daunting if you have a lot of it to process regularly. So over the years, we have uh, come up with a tool that we really like, and it's probably not the only one for this job. But So what we use, I'm going to hold it up here, it's a knife, obviously, but it's a, it, they're called a hollow edge knife, or uh, there is another which is, we believe, a brand. This is not from that brand, but it sometimes gets applied to knives made by others. Uh, Santoku, I think is what they call it, uh, which is a knife 
brand, but we did a little bit of reading and uh, that name comes up a lot even when it's off-brand uh, versions of this. But the generic term would be hollow edge knife. So you can see it quite well here. Um, the reason they call it hollow edge is there's a series of little divots up the side of the knife. So the blade is, the sharp part of the blade is obviously down here. But what this does, for, for squash anyways, for, for anything really, but where it really excels for squash is that it doesn't bind. So what happens when you're cutting, you cut down into the squash with, with most knives, no matter how sharp they are, as the, as the body of the knife comes down into the squash or the squash comes up the knife, it'll bind on it. And that'll make it really hard to cut it. I'm not going to say this makes it super easy, but by having these little divots, uh, you get a little airspace and the knife basically goes through the skin and the rind a lot better uh, than a normal knife. Now, another obvious tip here is make sure your knives are sharp um, because squash skin, depending on the variety, can be really hard. <laughs> so a sharp knife is going to be a big, uh, a big positive as well. So here we have a uh, green striped Kershaw squash, a rather big one. Their skin is hard, but it's not necessarily as hard as some squash. Some of the uh, the winter Hubbard squashes and stuff are a lot harder. Um, but as I was saying, something that's also a good tool, this is kind of a two-in-one combo, is a knife sharpener of some description. Because I like these ones, because when you when you go to sharpen it, it's very simple. Simple. You hold on to it so your your uh, fingers are out of the way. And of course there's a guide, so as you can kind of see, it goes in, you slide it through, you can't really hurt yourself on it. So, as I was saying, all squash are a little different. This particular one, I'm basically going to try to cut it right in half. So, for simplicity's sake, I mean, one of the things, this is just a thought that we do, find out how the squash wants to sit on the table, and you start from there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break off the, the neck, because obviously we don't need that anymore. And I'm actually going to cut the smaller bit first, and then use that as a guide to go from the big, rather than attacking the, the big part, I'm going to start from up here. And so the squash wants to sit basically on the table like that. Like I say, make sure your fingers are out of the way, because you may have to use a fair bit of pressure. But it's as simple, and you can see that's not binding the way a different knife would. This is the one semi-negative to squash. This is fairly hard to cut, but uh, you need a, bit, a fair bit of force. But yeah, this basically stopped it from binding for the most part. So I am going to now set it up on end, and I've kind of got a guide. big enough now that I have to go to one side. And as you can see, I kind of zipped down that. And I'll switch now. And should Voila! pretty close. So one nice thing about this, it doesn't have to be perfect. But there we go. We have this now to the point that we can uh, clean the seeds out. Obviously we're going to save some of these seeds because this is a nice big squash and uh, we can get this cooking. Well guys, hopefully you found a few of those hacks helpful. That is one thing that we have learned in our numerous years now of preserving in the kitchen is how to make some shortcuts really work and tools that are just so helpful. So stay tuned because I'm sure we'll have more content similar to this as we go throughout our YouTube careers sharing what we do here in the kitchen and in the pantry with you.